Hatred and violence have become a plague in our society and in our nation. Can't even go to Walmart without being in fear. A couple weeks ago, someone went into a Walmart in El Paso, Texas, killing 22 people, injuring 24 others. Before that weekend was out, Dayton, Ohio saw 10 killed and 26 injured. Throughout this past year, we've seen many killings. Gilroy Garlic Festival in California with three killed and 11 wounded. Virginia Beach, Highlands Ranch, Colorado, UNC Charlotte, Aurora, Illinois, Ascension Paris, Los, excuse me, and Louisiana. Again and again. And this is just in this year alone. It seems as if you're not safe anywhere, whether it be schools or churches or synagogues or mosques, it has become a plague. African Americans fear for their lives. The El Paso shooter said that he was after Mexicans. How can this be in America? And what are we as Christians to do about this? This sermon is not meant to be political in any way. It is meant to be theological. It is meant for us to look into Scripture. For I believe that our opinions and responses should be guided by Scripture and prayer and the Holy Spirit much more than they are by any news channel, political party, or social media that we look at. We who are Christians need to turn to God and ask for answers. So many times we hear on TV pointing of fingers and blaming of others. There is so much that we agree on, and yet little is done because extremes seem to hold the day. Our nation seems stuck and at a standstill. So what does Jesus have to say about hatred and violence? Jesus came to pronounce the kingdom of God. He said that it was a kingdom of peace and justice. Jesus chose in the face of hatred to love and to show compassion. Jesus was not in his ministry long before he first engaged violence. John the Baptist, his cousin, the one who had come to proclaim the coming of Christ, was killed, was executed unjustly. And they came and asked Jesus what to do. And Jesus, instead of picking up a sword, responded in love and compassion and called John's disciples unto himself and cared for those who were now a sheep without a shepherd. Jesus suffered violence again and again, and yet he refused to give in to hate. When Jesus stood before Jerusalem, before he went to give his own life, he stood and he looked at Jerusalem and he wept and he cried. And why did he do that? Because he was looking at a city that he was loved, yet it was a city that was obsessed with power and corruption. It was one where Rome had its boot on the neck of the people. It was one where the zealots were taking up arms in the name of religion. It was one where the leaders of the temple who should have been leading the way were more concerned about power than they were about justice. You see, God grieves violence and calls his people to wage peace. In Genesis 6, we read this. The Lord saw how great the wickedness of the human race had become on earth, that every inclination in the thoughts of human hearts was only evil all of the time. And the Lord regretted that he had made human beings on the earth. And his heart was deeply troubled. And then as you read on, it says, And the earth was corrupt in God's sight, and it was filled with violence. If God grieved in the day of Noah, do you not think that God grieves today when our world is again filled with wickedness and violence? And that day God decided to start over and flood the earth, save for Noah and his family. And yet God put a rainbow in the sky to remind us of hope that he would never again flood the earth. That he would not destroy us in this manner. Rather, God chose another way. God sent to God's people prophets who came and said, do what is just, do what is right. God gave the law to Moses to show us what is right and what is wrong. And in the fullness of time, God sent his own son, our Lord Jesus Christ. God is seeking to bring us into a way of love. 
Jesus rejected violence again and again. When, when Jesus was about to go to the cross and one of his disciples took out a sword and cut off the ear of the high priest's servant, Jesus picked it up and he healed that man and he told his disciple to put back the sword. He said, for all who draw the sword will die by the sword. Jesus realized that violence only begets violence. That our first response might be hatred or revenge or wanting to strike back. But that is what terrorists want. Whether they are foreign terrorists or domestic terrorists, they are seeking to sow hatred and division within our country and nation. And Jesus warns the disciples that if you go down the path of violence, it only cycles into more violence. The Apostle Paul picked up this same thought. He said, if at all possible, as far as it depends on you, live at peace with everyone. You see, the Apostle Paul had, had tried violence. In the name of God, he had gone and he had killed Christians. And he met the Prince of Peace on that road to Damascus, and he literally saw the light. He was blinded by the love and grace of Jesus who called him unto a ministry of peace and reconciliation. And so Paul sought in all the churches he started to get the people to live at peace with one another. But how do we do that? Well, first, we realize that God created all of us in God's image and calls us to respect each other. Genesis 1, 27 says... And so God created mankind in his image. In the image of God created he them. Male and female created he them. Respect. Realizing that everyone is created in the image of God, as Aretha Franklin spelled it out to us, we do not need to look on the outside. Whether the color of someone's skin, their nationality, whether we like them or not, we should treat people with dignity. We should obey the golden rule and treat everyone we encounter as we would want to be treated. But we tend to fear that which we don't understand. Part of respect is seeking to understand the other. When Moses got the law, the Ten Commandments that we have been studying in our Sunday school for weeks now, one of the commands is that we shall not kill. It is very clear cut. We are not the judge. Vengeance and justice belongs to God. Yet Jesus took it even further. Jesus said in that Sermon on the Mount, you have heard it said of those of old, you shall not murder and whoever murders is in danger of judgment. But I say to you that whoever is angry with his brother without cause shall be in danger of judgment. Jesus goes to the heart of the matter. Jesus knows that we look at others and that we don't understand and that we fear and that hatred and bigotry can set in to our lives. And that it is a matter of our hearts and minds. I know you probably have heard the Native American story about the grandfather who's talking to his grandson and he says, son, there are two wolves living inside of you. One is evil, he is angry, he is envious, he is sorrowful, regretful, he has greed and arrogance and self-pity and guilt and resentment, inferiority, he lies, he has false pride, he has great ego. The other wolf is good, he is filled with joy and peace and love and hope and serenity and humility and kindness, benevolence, empathy, generosity, truth, compassion and faith. This same fight is going on inside of each and every person you encounter. And the little boy calls out to his grandfather, which wolf will win? We all know the answer. The one you feed, he says. The one you allow to control your heart and your mind. You see, we must move past just simple respect and begin to love others. Someone once said, diversity is having a seat at the table. Inclusion is having a voice, but belonging is having that voice heard. To listen to the others, whether or not we agree with them, but to hear them and to come together and to reason in peace. You see, it begins with respect, but God calls us as God's people to move past just respecting the others 
and to love others, to being love. In the Old Testament, we hear, for the Lord is good and his love endures forever. His faithfulness continues throughout all generations. We might say back in the Old Testament, God doesn't seem like the God of love, but again and again, God's hesed, his loving kindness is spoken of. In fact, God created out of overflowing love. That is why we even exist. And then we are told in the New Testament that God is love. 1 John 4, 8 says, Whoever does not love does not know God because God is love. It is not just God's nature, it is God's very essence. We cannot follow God and hate. We cannot follow God and be people of violence. No matter how many times folks might rise up in the name of religion and hate and produce violence, it is not biblical for God is love John also says there is no fear in love but perfect love drives out all fear you see we fear what we do not understand we seek to control it because we are afraid but perfect love drives out all fear when we were in Belize we told you that as folks came into the dental clinic Dr. Hunter was there attending to their dental needs, but there were others who were surrounding them singing songs like Jesus loves me because they wanted them to know that there was nothing to be afraid of for they were in a loving, caring place. When folks come into First Baptist Church, do they sense and feel God's love? Do they know this is a place they may not fear anything? For they will be loved they will be loved with the love of God. Martin Luther King Jr. reminded us of violence and where it leads and of love and where it can lead. He said the ultimate weakness of violence is that it's a descending spiral, begetting the very thing it seeks to destroy. Instead of diminishing evil, it multiplies it. Through violence, you may murder the liar, but you cannot murder the lie nor establish the truth. Through violence, you may murder the hater, but you do not murder the hate. In fact, violence merely increases hate. So it goes, returning violence for violence multiple times, adding deeper darkness to a night already devoid of stars. Darkness cannot drive out darkness. Only light can do that. Hate cannot drive out hate. Only love can do that. Friends, that's a Baptist pastor. That is someone we can emulate. You see, it's not just about loving and saying that we love. God, through all of God's scriptures, has said, if you truly love, then you must act. For God cares about the least of these and calls us to do the same. How do we overcome violence and hatred? We live out love. In Deuteronomy 10, we hear in this law, For God defends the cause of the fatherless and the widow and loves the foreigner residing among you, giving them food and clothing, and you are to love those who are foreigners. For you yourselves were foreigners in Egypt. In the law, God specifically points out three groups of folks that need special attention. He talks about the orphans, the fatherless, those children who have nothing. He talks about the widow that in that day would have very little those who were in deep need and he talks about the stranger the foreigner who is often out of place and does not know which way to turn and he says remember that you too were like that one day at the base of the statue of liberty it says give me your tired your poor your huddled masses yearning to breathe free the wretched refuse of your teeming shore Send these, the homeless, the tempest tossed to me. I will lift my lamp beside the golden door. This is the vision for America. That we see those who are in need and we take them in and we love them and we develop them. This is the vision that God has for us. The prophets repeated this same thing for us again and again. In Zechariah 7, 9, and 10 it says, And this is what the Lord God Almighty says, 
administer true justice, show mercy and compassion to one another. Do not oppress the widow or the fatherless or the foreigner or the poor. Do not plot evil against each other. Why did God have to send the prophets again and again to remind us? Because we forget. Back in our own stained glass, it reminds us of Matthew 25, where the king truly says, Whatever you did for the least of these, my brothers and sisters, you did it unto me. We have Operation Inasmuch each and every year. But my friends at our church, it should be Operation Inasmuch each and every day of our lives. Those who are in need should be cared for. We should seek justice. So in the face of this violence of our culture today, what can we who are Christians do? Well, we can choose to ignore it, pretend it's not happening. We can choose to embrace it. We can choose to say we just want to be violent as well and respond with hatred with hate. Or we can look to Scripture. We can pray. We can ask the Holy Spirit what it is we should do. I've already laid out much of what I think we should do as a people of God. But it has to start with ourselves. We have to examine our own hearts and our own minds and ask ourselves, is there hatred, is there bitterness, is there prejudice? What is it that lives in us or is it the love of God flowing out of us? We as a church, do we stand for the cause of Christ? We have to make a decision, a decision that we will love as God loves, that we will love those whom God loves, that we will help those who are in need, that we will advocate for the poor, that we will stand for justice and righteousness. There's always a choice to be made. Years ago, Baltimore experienced some riots. There was broken glass everywhere. There's trash strewn through the streets. Uh, it wasn't really a surprise to see that. We see this kind of thing on the news all of the time. What I was surprised to see, however, was what happened the next day. It didn't make much of the news, but it was there if you looked. People came out and showed up to clean up. They were from different nationalities. They were of different colors. They were different socioeconomic backgrounds. But they were there working hand in hand, sweeping up glass, picking up trash. There was a mother with two children. The newscaster came over and said to her, why are you doing this? And she said, because I wanted to teach my children there's always something loving and good you can do. That's what we taught them in church, and so that's what we must do today. What is a Christian response to hatred and to violence in our world? It is to love with the love of God and to act on that love.